And the yes. title of my uh, lecture today is Sjogren Syndrome, the paradigm and example of a systemic autoimmune disorder moving towards precision medicine. Here are my disclosures. And on this slide, you see the lecture outline. First, I shall discuss issues of precision medicine, how we define it and the readouts. We'll move to the systemic autoimmunity and Sjogren syndrome in particular. We'll discuss disease phenotypes and the development of uh, the disease phenotyping, the so-called disease phenotyping. A few words on pathogenesis and the biomarkers and how we try to put them all together moving towards precision medicine. Precision medicine has been started in Greece. And as you see here, Hippocrates at 400 BC was the first to say that it is far more important to know what person has a particular disease than what disease the person has. And later, during the Hippocratic thought, and development of the Western medicine, it was apparent that medicine is not absolute. Thus, its directions cannot be generalized to everybody. Each human body organism is different and responds different to therapy. Therefore, the same treatment cannot be suitable for everybody. And finally, the physician should choose the appropriate treatment depending on the patient individual characteristics, such as comorbidities, the health status and lifestyle activities, diet, etc. So you see that from the ancient, ancient years, the so-called Western medicine appreciated very well the individual's milieu for the disease developed. In recent years, and particularly in the 21st century, and after the resolution of the human genome, it was apparent that precision or personalized medicine refers to a medical model that uses individual phenotypes, genotypes, and several characteristics of patients aiming to tailor the right treatment at the right dose for the right person at the right time. Also, to predict diseases and to prevent diseases. The initiator for that was actually Francis Collins. Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health at the United States, was the Human Genome Project person, along with many other very important scientists all over the world. And of course, that took a lot of publicity. You see in the picture here, President Obama to announce the uh, Precision medicine, announcing the precision medicine project. And here is a crude difference between what we call traditional medicine, in which one size fits all approaches, while in precision medicine, the medicine should be tailored to its patient individual. From this way, to come here at this point, it's a lot of work that has to be done. And 
here we, is the one size fits all medicine. If you have a pneumonia, pneumonia is treated almost the same for everybody. We are now here in the stratified medicine. The stratification is meaning patients are grouped by disease subtypes, demographics, clinical future, biomarking, and we are fasting moving towards to personalization, taking into account, taking into consideration patient individual preferences, medication histories, environment, behaviors, habits, etc., etc. To move forward, we have science have created a toolkit a toolkit of precision medicine. And the toolkit includes omics data, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, etc., by which we are able to identify diagnostic and prognostic biomarker, to identify molecular signatures and networks and also trace out new potential therapeutic targets. This will come together with a deep clinical phenotyping that will take into account not only the elements of a particular disease, but also other features of the human body, including cognition, including major functions, Etc., etc. And of course, these approaches are radically changed our, our uh, understanding of medical education. Did the new students in the medical schools? and younger fellows in the hospital should learn the value of precision medicine and the interpretation of novel diagnostic tests. They must understand and recognize the factors that impair the use of more precision medicine approaches, and they should also be familiar appreciating the interaction with the new actors, new sciences entering the fields, the field of medical sciences, including genetics, biomedical engineering, bioinformatics, etc. So, the, this type of approach that will be very important for the coming years carries also several other aspects and one of it is a particularly interested for civis is the medical education here is the field where i'm working it is the autoimmune rheumatic diseases autoimmune rheumatic diseases affect generally around 5 to 8 percent of the general population. Despite that, the rarity, they constitute the second cause for hospitalization in internal medicine clinics. They are the third cause of morbidity and mortality and they can be divided in organ-specific and systemic diseases. As the name says, they are organ-specific, meaning that only one organ is affected. Systemic is that many organs are affected. A classic example of the organ-specific diseases is thyroiditis or diabetes type 1 for systemic diseases is systemic lupus erythematosus. Clinical characteristics of systemic autoimmune diseases. The, it is very important for someone who wants to 
strive on systemic autoimmunity to understand the basic properties of these diseases. They are chronic. They may have involved different organs and they may, they may be overlapping. In other words, there are diseases in which they have overlapping symptoms, the same symptoms for many diseases. And Sjogren syndrome among them is particularly important for me. I have worked over 35 years for the disease. Is a female disease affecting nine males, females to one male. And now, after the harmonics project, I'm going to talk a little bit later for that. We understand that is 20 to 1, not 9 to 1, is a rather common disease. It is a second most common systemic autoimmune rheumatic diseases and the second most common autoimmune disease affecting women. It usually appears in the middle age, in the perimenopausal age of ladies, in the fourth and fifth decade of life. It is slowly progressive and difficult to be treated. And it can be seen in a primary form or overlapping with virtually every other systemic autoimmune disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus dermatomyositis, and scleroderma. As for every systemic autoimmune rheumatic disease, there are not hallmarks, hallmarking criteria, uh, pathogenetic things and, and clinical symptoms to define the disease. The disease is diagnosed based on particular classification criteria. And on this slide, I'm showing you that we need five criteria the first is the labial salivary gland biopsy that shows silabenitis because dry mouth, because of the affection of salivary gland from the autoimmune process is very important. This waits for three. Particular autoantibodies such as anti antibodies waits also for three. And uh, Ocular staining score, in other words, affection, affection of, of uh, 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 the eyes by the autoimmune process waits for one. Silmer's test, another ocular test, also for one. And, and uh, the unstimulated whole saliva flow, flow rate against one. In order to get the patient diagnosed correctly, you need to have a score equal or more than four. And on this slide, you see the major elements of the disease that define the, its autoimmune nature. The first is the infiltration of the exocrine glands by activated T and B lymphocytes. And the second is hypergamma globulinemia, as shown here on the slide. And these gamma globulins contain plethora of different autoantibodies. Sjogren syndrome is for every systemic rheumatic disease has many systemic clinical manifestations. For academic purposes, it can be, they can be divided in non-specific, for example, Raynaud's phenomenon fatigue and arthralgias, meaning that these non-specific manifestations can be found also in many other systemic diseases. 
is very epithelial manifestations like sialadenitis or dacriadenitis, interstitial renal disease, primary biliary cirrhosis and small airways disease in the lungs, extra epithelial manifestations that, that they are concluded as immune complex mediated vasculitis. And very interestingly, around 5% of patients may later develop B cell lymphoma. In other words, Sjogren's syndrome is, is a disease which is found at the crossroads of autoimmunity and lymphoid malignancy. Here you see the clinical utility of a such type of grouping of uh, the systemic manifestations. Periepithelial manifestations, you see here the labial salivary gland biopsy surrounded the salivary ducts by the autoreactive B and T cells, peritubular infiltrates in the kidney, peribronchial infiltrates in the lungs, and pericholangeal infiltrates in the liver. They appear early in the course of the disease, together with the dry mouth and dry eye. They may remain stable for many years and has a low frequency of terminal organ damage. On the other hand, extraepithelial manifestations, vasculitic manifestations, have a late, is a late clinical sequel. They usually found many years after the disease onset. They have a severe organ damage if untreated. This is very important. And they are all predictive factors for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma development. As I told you previously, one of the most important findings of Sjogren's is the development of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is higher in every systemic autoimmune rheumatic disease compared to the general population. But while it's only 4%, four, four times more in rheumatoid arthritis and seven times more in lupus, in Sjogren's, the, high, the risk is as high as 20 times. Is it important? It is absolutely important because if you see, the mortality of Sjogren's is heavily affected by the presence of lymphoma. You see here that the standardized mortality ratio of patients with lymphoma is three and more times more the general population, while Sjogren's patients without lymphoma the standardized mortality rate ratio is almost the same as for the general population. And we treat these patients with lymphoma, usually with classical uh, chemotherapeutic agents. This is a slide that shows what we did 22 years ago in our, in our department. You see here that the mild lymphomas, that they have the best prognosis, have a median overall survival, 6.3 years, while the so-called bad lymphomas, poor prognosis, prognosis lymphomas, such as the diffuse large B cell lymphomas, the median overall survival was, was less than two years. But during time, and with the development of targeted treatments, and particularly B cell depletion treatment, here is our cohort of patients with lymphoma and Sjogren's, that is the largest co cohort in the globe. You see here that the overall survival using our chop has much improved very much, very much. And this 
was a really, uh, a really advance of the medical science. And understand also that we have predictive patterns for lymphoma, for future lymphoma in children that will all are extracted from the initial presentation of Sjogren's syndrome. And these factors are cryoglobulinemia, Sjogren's syndrome activity at diagnosis, and focus score, focus score on the salivary gland biopsy again on Sjogren's diagnosis. Meaning that we can predict a neoplastic disease based on the initial clinical and uh, uh, laboratory features of the autoimmune milieu of the patient many, many, many years ago before lymphoma development. So the question is, who is the patient who will develop lymphoma and who is not? And it is the time to define the disease phenotype. The disease phenotype, the clinical phenotype, is any observable characteristic or trait of a given disease that includes morphology, development, biochemical or physiological properties, and behavior, but without any implication of a mechanism. We are not interested at this point for the mechanism. If you put the mechanism behind the disease phenotype, then you are talking for the disease endotype. So the disease, a particular disease, might have many phenotypes, and each phenotype, is governed, is created by certain pathogenetic mechanisms which constitute the disease endotype. That fits not only for sugars, but for virtually every systemic autoimmune disease. And indeed, for every disease and for shockers, there is a high level of heterogeneity in clinical phenotypes, in the pathologic variability, in other words, what we see in the biopsy of the patient, in the outcome of patients, and the response to treatment. So what we are trying to do for shortage, but many physicians, physician scientists and biologists for other diseases as well, is to define a roadmap, a conceptual stepwise categorization of our patients, starting from the clinical stratification, this was the definition before some years, mild disease and severe disease, mild diseases when we have organ-specific exocrinopathy, severe disease is when we have systemic disease in lymphoma. Then we try to do a histological stratification of patients, because you see here three different biopsies. In this biopsy, T cells, T lymphocytes predominate. In this biopsy, B lymphocytes predominate. And here we have macrophages. Following the second step, that is histologic stratification, we must uh, uh, we, we must apply a system biology approach that will give us candidate biomarkers 
then following the biomarkers and after the, the definition of biomarkers and after validation of them, we go to a molecular stratification and then we'll probably have the ability to define homogeneous spacing groups vulnerable for a particular targeted treatment. And this is the way, a multi-step way for the correct stratification of patients. So far, the clinical stratification is not called anymore clinical stratification, it's called clinical phenotyping of a given disease. There are many issues that should be solved in approaching the clinical phenotyping of patients with systemic diseases. There are missing data. We do not have all clinical or laboratory data for each patient. Data is sometimes heterogeneous. There is a minimal input on the dynamic picture of the disease per clinical phenotype. Physicians usually see the patient in a static picture. We must get a dynamic picture of the disease. That is the most important thing. Definition of disease-related biomarkers, not in general, but per clinical phenotype is a must. We must do it. Also, there is a small number of patients. A small number of patients, because they are all cohort studies, usually is an important obstacle in applying a such approach. To address this question, we have created five years ago the Harmonics Project is a networking and optimizing the use of population and patient cohorts at European Union level to investigate Sjogren's syndrome. Here is the consortium. There were all European centers working with Sjogren's, but also two, uh, two centers from the United States and we created the Harmonics core architecture, a platform with three layers, an input layer, a cohort data management layer, and a cohort data analytics layer. In this electronic platform that had a data provider, a data processor, and a data user, we were able to harmonize all patients of Europe, of, of, of Europe with Sjogren's in a single data set. To do it, we have used curated uh, data, curation stages include the metadata extraction, descriptive statistics, similarity detection, outlier detection, data imputation, and data diagnostics report. And it is shown here on the slide how the data was curated. One of the most important and innovative uh, features of this platform, on the creation of the platform, is the so-called federated learning. Federated learning include definition of training and testing cohorts, initialization of artificial intelligent algorithms, training of artificial intelligence uh, models, validation and distribution of the artificial intelligence model-based readout 
that is mostly important to harmonize all patients. And this was really innovative, the federated learning. I'm going to show to you in, in, in a small video of harmonics. And let me tell you that that was the uh, way we did such type of studies in the beginning. Each cohort gave in a centralized repository the data. But this is not permitted now because of eGDPR. So we created a central processing engine. And the, centrally pro the central processing engine sends the algorithms to each particular center. And the work is done in each particular center without moving the data outside the, this, this particular cohort. And this was really innovative. And here are the results. At the end, we have harmonized more than 7,000 persons with Sjogren syndrome, and we were able to present now some results. And here are the first results using the training artificial intelligence models for, for 2,000 patients. And you see the difference of Sjogren's in males and females and in males male patients with Sjogren have a larger probability to get lymphoma compared to females again using this data we were able to describe first in the literature the differences between young patients with Sjogren's young age and older age patients with Sjogren's compared, they constitute the one third, these are the two thirds compared with the mean age. And it was found that indeed, younger patients with Sjogren's have a phenotype, a more aggressive phenotype reminiscent patients with lupus and they have increased lymphoma risk and it was the same also for older patients this data is actually published very recently as you see here and it is this type of data actually constitute the first approach to a clinical phenotyping following a harmonization process that is very important. We're also able to see that the focus score, meaning the grade of the, of the salivary gland biopsy, is a very important element for future prediction of lymphoma development. And you see here that patients with focus score more than four has a very high probability to get lymphoma development compared to those with focus score less than four. And when we apply the traditional factors of lymphoma development, we understood that patients with less than focus score and salivary gland enlargement parotid gland enlargement, that is a predictive factor for lymphoma development in Sjogren's, they must get a second biopsy after some years, while patients with focus score more than four, in those patients only focus score per se was the predictive factor for lymphoma development and for the everyday clinical practice what we do using this type of information is that when we have a patient with Sjogren syndrome, a focus score less than four, a second biopsy is done only if you have a history of salivary gland enlargement at nine years, when if you have a very heavy focus score, then the second biopsy at the four years. Also, 
we have evaluated the seronegative patients, patients with no autoantibody specificities, seronegative patients of Sjogren's, and we found that triple seronegative patients and quadruple seronegative patients are Sjogren's with a good prognosis since they do not have systemic disease or lymphoma development. So using this type of data, we are able for the first time in the literature of Sjogren's to define patients with lower risk and patients with increased risk for lymphoma development. A few words on pathogenesis, as it is important to de define new biomarkers. In Sjogren's syndrome, the major cell is the epithelium, epithelium. As I told you in the beginning of my talk, and the epithelium after some insults, that is most probably a persistent virus infection, stress, or endocrine actions, and in particular estrogen deprivation, changes. The epithelium has gets several MHC class two molecules that they are important for antigen presentation to be expressed in cellular surface together with costimulatory molecules such as B7 or CD40. They also, it also expresses accessory molecules, adhesion molecules such as ICAMS and start secreting several cytokines and lymphoid chemokines. Lymphoid chemokines are those chemokines which are very important to organize ectopic germinal centers. And when the epithelium changes, attracts the immune cells such as T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, the antigen presentation and eventually the several cytokines create clonal expansion of T lymphocytes that help B lymphocytes which in turn are clonally expanded as well and then a vicious cycle response and the autoimmune injury is uh, is there, is perpetuated. Using this type of data, several experiments try to see whether what happens if you get in contact with the epithelial cells of Sjogren's with naive B cells, T cells, and T follicular helper cells. And you see here that every cellular population regarding the immune system, either B cells or T cells, are heavily affected by the epithelial cells. B cell expresses genes. There is increased B cell sur survival, higher and more dense expression of costimulatory molecules. T lymphocytes are also increased, activated, and differentiated into T follicular helper cells. And T follicular helper cells that are the main source of IL-21 express several costimulatory molecules such as IPOS that are currently target of treatment in Sjogren's syndrome. So you see how from some initial findings, we become more narrow in getting information about the molecules 
involved in the pathogenesis of the disease. And indeed, we are doing it to define biomarkers. And the biomarkers are usually useful for disease diagnosis, disease severity, outcome, and response to treatment. But if you ask a simple question, why the biomarker is there, then you immediately change the landscape. And you see that the biomarker has to do something with the pathogenetic mechanism or the disease ex expression mechanism. And if you think in a such way, then you get information about new target selection for treatment and for a correct patient stratification. You see here in Shogun's, we are lucky enough to have a clear, crystal clear, poor outcome that is the malignant B cell lymphoma. And from the preclinical stage of Sjogren's until the development, disease onset, until the development of Frank B cell lymphoma, there are multiple steps in which many molecules are involved. And these molecules, if are tracely correct, if are correctly traced, they can be proved to be very useful biomarkers. And you will give me the opportunity to present two biomarkers like them. The first is the miRNAs, and particularly this miRNA 200B5P, that is a pan suppressor oncogene. miRNA is very low in patients with lymphoma and Sjogren's, but also in pre-lymphoma and Sjogren's. These patients do not have lymphoma. They have the bad prognostic factors for lymphoma. And you see the biomarker is there before lymphoma development. So this is a very important biomarker for two reasons. The first is that it can be traced before lymphoma development. And the second, it has to do with the pathogenesis of lymphoma development. And you see here the, the ROC curves of this particular biomarker, which is gray, and the cutoff point. Here are patients with this miRNA more than 0.4. You see here how different is that if the biomarker is very low, less than 0.4, in that case, the green case, almost all patients develop lymphoma. The second is CCLX13. CCLX13 is expressed, is a chemokine expressed by follicular dendritic cells, major antigen presenting cells participating in the salivary gland pathology. Here is the LIGA, the CCX35, and CCLX13 keeps a vital role in the development and organization of lymphoid follicles. We have investigated in a very nice experiment, one short three sample experiment. In other words, we got salivary gland biopsy serum and saliva at a single shot. At the same time, from 30 patients without lymphoma, 15 Sjogren's patients with lymphoma, 11 controls, 10 healthy controls, and 6 disease controls, that is non Sjogren's associated lymphoma. You see here the expression of CCLX13 with this autoantibody in the salivary gland biopsy. You see here how well operates in Sjogren's and particularly in Sjogren's lymphoma in the serum and the excellent relation 
we the salivary gland pathology serum levels here and and salivary gland pathology here you see the difference and it works in the serum but it didn't work in saliva any this uh this led us to suggest that chocolate is a systemic disease is not local disease to be expressed in the saliva. Changes are apparent in the serum of patients. And just to finish, we are trying to define a molecular classification of patients using the techniques, the techniques I told you in the beginning of my lecture that is transcriptomics, genomics, modern and robust flow cytometry, proteomics, metabolomics, etc. I'll show you the results of precise sets of uh, Jacques Olivier Pers just published a few months ago. The idea was to investigate the RNA sec from whole blood in patients with Sjogren syndrome and you see here that the transcriptomic analysis define four different subgroups of patients C1, cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3, and cluster 4. This is interferon signature. Cluster 2 is like the healthy persons. In cluster three, there is a prominent B cell component, and classic four is a classical inflammatory response, acute phase response. The idea is now to put together with the transcriptomics findings the clinical phenotyping to define useful, potentially useful biomarkers per disease phenotype. So my dear friends and colleagues, that is the way I learned medicine to define clinical and laboratory indices, genes and proteins of interest. And this is the definition of disease associated markers. We are now in the era of molecular stratification and the definition of biomarkers using genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, I mean, systems biology approaches. And we are doing it in order to go through the last stage, that is functional definition of functional interactions, tying host environment dependent on off signals. In other words, to narrow and to define not diseases, but to define procedure. And this is the way to go in the so-called precision medicine for systemic autoimmune diseases. And with this last slide, I would like to thank all my collaborators in the Department of Pathophysiology and also the harmonics partners. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dufas. If there are any questions, we have uh, three or four minutes. I would be delighted to answer if I can, of course. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all the best for the rest of the week and have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Bye. Maybe maybe I will ask a question if nobody does. Yasu, how are you finding? I missed you since the NIH period where you left to Mexico.
<laughs> yes. So I am trying to return to Greece. Very good. Yes. Happy, happy to see you in my office when we'll visit Athens. Ah, uh, very good. The, the, um, uh, in, in your talk, you, you mentioned there at, at one point, this need to inter of interaction between the medical professionists and those of us who are uh, working on the biology side of of the things and not only yes um could i hear if, now i'm thinking very generally here but uh, uh we are um, as i'm returning to greece are there any fora in place in our country where these interactions take place yes uh there is the newly founded Center for Precision Medicine of the Medical School of the University of Athens, where we use uh, all these techniques. Uh, there are also good research institutes as well, like the, um, uh, the Fleming Institute that is run by George Collias and, and, and uh, the IVEA Institute, the, the Institute of Academy. Yes, I think there is a place for a person like you to work here in Athens. I would be delighted to discuss it in person with you, Fanny. Okay, I, I will write to you then uh, to, to sure. expose also the, the um, uh, aspect that uh, interests me in relation with autoimmune disease. I would be delighted to discuss it. Uh, when uh, you, you mentioned a few antibodies that are used in the patients, but is there also a, a, a drug that is commonly given to patients with shorgans? Yes, we usually treat this, some of the uh, extraglandular manifestations of these patients with, with hydroxychloroquine, plaquenil. Uh, rituximab works well also. Rituximab is a B cell depletion treatment, not a CD20 treatment. So uh, the, the... It works well for vasculitis of Sjogren's and lymphoma. There are some studies, very promising studies for this. The, the reason I want to talk to you is precisely because of the hydroxychinurenin uh, aspect. Okay. Uh, the, uh, my attempt to understand how that drug works uh, tells me that the mechanism of action of the drug is still not known yes right and and then we we did a few experiments with the drug and i have a few things to discuss with you but i i guess this is not the forum to do it now um, I would be delighted to have you in my department to talk uh, with my group uh, and, and uh, exchange ideas. Yes, I understand that, uh, I mean, the TLR7 uh, uh, pathogenetic thing is not the only one, most probably, for, for hydroxychloroquine. So we understand partly uh, the action of hydroxychloroquine. It's very interesting. It's mm -hmm. very interesting to discuss it. Okay, uh, I, w I was very happy to hear your talk today. Very, very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. Goodbye. If there are no other questions or comments, thank you so much. Bye.